Thank you all for being here to celebrate the life of Bennett Bosky. My name is Harold Kahn, and I am the husband of Bennett's niece, Lisa. I was privileged to know Bennett for almost 40 years. All who are fortunate to know Bennett will surely agree that he was an extraordinary man. In these days of great inflation and handing out superlatives like candy, it is easy to discount statements of high praise. But that would be a mistake in the case of Bennett Bosky. Bennett was an A-plus man at a time when an A-plus was reserved for the very few. I don't just mean that he was an excellent student, although he certainly did extremely well at Williams College and Harvard Law School. When I refer to Bennett as an A-plus student, as an A-plus man, I am referring to his many exceptional talents and attributes. Bennett had superb judgment. He was truly a lawyer's lawyer. He was extremely generous with his time, knowledge, and resources. He was much loved by his wife, Shirley, and all his family. Today, we will hear from several people who will speak about Bennett's exceptional talents and attributes. We will hear from leaders of the ALI and friends and family. If time permits, there may be an opportunity for any of you who desire to do so, to give a few remarks about Bennett. I will provide a brief sketch of his life. Bennett would have been 100 on August 14th of this year. He was born in the administration of Woodrow Wilson and liked to tell the story of having shaken President Calvin Coolidge's hand when he was a boy. The son of a prominent New York City attorney, Bennett was literally born into the law. He commenced his studies at Williams shortly after his 15th birthday, briefly considered a career as an economist, and then in the summer of 1936, as he was turning 20, he sent a letter to Harvard Law School seeking admission, and as he told the story, by return mail, the school said, please join us. He was sitting in his seat at Harvard Law School three weeks later. He was on the Law Review his second year and was the book review editor his third year. Bennett particularly enjoyed retelling the story of his editing J. Edgar Hoover's Mammoth Book Review to about a tenth of its original length. <laughs> For the last three quarters of his life, volumes 51 and 52 of the HLR held pride of place for Bennett. At Harvard Law School, he took the federal jurisdiction seminar taught by then professor, soon to be Justice Felix Frankfurter. Bennett must have been a standout student in that class because Frankfurter tapped him to be a law clerk to judge learned hand on the Second Circuit and the following year secured Bennett's selection as the sole law clerk for United States Supreme Court Justice Stanley Reed. In the summer of 1940, at the end of his clerkship with Judge Learned Hand, Bennett married Shirley Ecker, then a law student, and herself a daughter of two attorneys. Bennett and Shirley's 58 years of marriage was a great partnership between two highly accomplished and brilliant people. They loved each other deeply and shared many interests, especially traveling and all things British. Shirley was Bennett's biggest supporter and vice versa. They quietly and unostentatiously reveled in each other's many successes. Shirley and Bennett had planned to spend only a year in D.C. in 1940-41, while Shirley completed law school and Bennett clerked for Justice Reed, and then returned to New York City where their families lived. They never left D.C. Bennett became the quintessential Washington lawyer, and Shirley had an outstanding career with the World Bank. While clerking for Justice Reed, Bennett came to the attention of Chief Justice Harlan Fist Stone, who hired Bennett as his senior law clerk for two years. During his tenure with Stone, Bennett worked on the saboteurs case, a case that he believed was one of the most important decisions in the history of that court. Turning down a third year with Chief Justice Stone, Bennett briefly worked in the War Division of the Justice Department and then enlisted in the U.S. Army where he spent almost three years working on highly sensitive legal projects. 
After the war, Bennett worked in the State Department and then joined the Council's office of the newly formed Atomic Energy Commission, where he worked for four years. For the rest of Bennett's life, he was specially interested in matters of atomic energy and the related issues of stopping the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In 1951, Bennett left government for good. He briefly had his own practice and then joined forces with his former boss at the AEC to form the law firm which would later be known as Volpe, Bosky, and Lyons. Bennett worked with that firm for 45 years until 1996 when he had his own solo office. For many years, while he was working with Volpe, Bosky, and Lyons, Bennett was also a partner in his father's New York City law firm, which called itself Bosky, Bosky, and Cole. Bennett frequently spoke with great pride about the fact that he was not a specialist. His legal practice was extremely broad and would confound most modern-day lawyers. His legal work covered litigation, corporate transactions, probate, and regulatory issues. During the 50s and 60s, Bennett appeared with some frequency before the Supreme Court and was appointed by that court on several occasions to represent indigent litigants. Bennett's great knowledge of the Supreme Court and his intense interest in its rules and procedures led to his taking on the near lifelong project as the author of West's Federal Forums, focusing on the Supreme Court. Bennett became one of a small number, no more than five, of the country's leading experts in Supreme Court procedure. When his good friend Ed Levy became President Ford's Attorney General, Bennett's name was included in a short list of possible successors to Justice William Douglas, the seat that went to Justice Stevens. As if to emphasize that Bennett was truly a lawyer's lawyer, Attorney General Levy retained Bennett to represent him in cases where Levy was sued in his individual or personal capacity, as distinct from his official capacity. At Volpe, Bosky, and Lyons, Bennett was ably assisted by Sharon Watson, who has been his figurative right arm for many years, more years than Sharon would probably want me to mention. I'm certain that Bennett would not forgive me if I didn't take this opportunity to acknowledge the amazing work that Sharon has done with and for Bennett at the law firm and in Bennett's solo practice the past 20 years. Also with us is Shelley, who worked hand in hand with both Sharon and Bennett for many years. Bennett's life story cannot be fairly captured in just a few minutes. He did so many things, worked with and on behalf of so many people and institutions. His legacy is a very long one. Among all this work, two connections stand out. First and foremost, Bennett's participation in and leadership of the American at Law Institute. I will leave it to other speakers far more knowledgeable than me to describe what Bennett did with the ALI. But what I can say is that it was evident to Bennett's family that Bennett loved working with the ALI and deeply respected its important mission. He told me on several occasions that he believed he got much more from the ALI than what he gave to it. And it is so fitting that this memorial service is held here today in conjunction with the ALI meeting. The second connection I want to highlight is Bennett's nearly 60 years on the board of the primary day school, a private elementary school. The school credits Bennett as helping it in virtually every capacity from providing much needed device, advice on every conceivable subject to arranging for the funding for its building. He is the hero of that school. Bennett and Shirley did not have children. As a result, their three nieces, Lisa, Amy, and Sarah, and nephew, Andrew, became, excuse the legalese, quasi-children to them. <laughs> Shirley and Bennett doted on them and followed their lives very closely. I know that Lisa, Amy, Sarah, and Andrew feel very fortunate to have had such a close relationship with such wonderful people as Shirley and Bennett. My mother-in-law, Laura Ludwig, deserves special mention here. Since Shirley's death, she has channeled for Shirley and done an extraordinary job to fill in for the irreplaceable void left by Shirley's passing. 
My most vivid memories of Bennett are of his sitting in the living room of my in-law's house, surrounded by slip opinions of the Supreme Court, drafts of restatements, and innumerable papers from his law practice. Bennett would sit for hours by himself reviewing these materials. To watch him was to watch a pro at work, every bit as much as watching Michael Jordan shoot hoops or Tiger Woods putt golf balls. On occasion, I would ask him if I could intrude on his work. He never said no. I would ask him what he was doing or what he thought of a particular event, case, or person. Bennett's answers, given over the course of more than 30 years on countless occasions, was for me a legal education better than any that could be received in any law school or by reading any legal papers. I was in the presence of one of those rare masters and was very lucky to be his audience. I will miss him greatly. We are fortunate today to have a number of speakers who touched various aspects of Bennett's life. Our first speaker is Roberta Cooper Ramo, the president of the American Law Institute. First, let me thank everybody in Bennett's family for letting us share this moment. I can't think, I I was trying to think when I heard that Bennett had passed away, and given his age, this should not have been a shock, I was surprised. And I had so looked forward, as Sharon knows, to an annual Sunday visit that we had. Uh, Bennett, having read everything, having a lot of things to tell me, particularly about the uh, disastrous way I was leading the, leaving the investments of the Institute. Uh, and I couldn't actually believe it, uh, which is a crazy thing to say about someone who was almost 100 years old. And I had told the Institute, after I had talked to Bennett and gotten his permission last year on Sunday, that I was going to somehow have him here for a hundredth celebration today. And I had been thinking we would Skype him. I just couldn't quite figure out how we were going to do it, but I, I was quite convinced he would be here. And I realized as I spoke to the opening of our annual meeting on Monday that indeed he was. Bennett Bosky is in this institute in every ongoing way. There is not a thing that we do that is not informed by him. There is not a procedure that we have in which he has not had his hand. But most of all, it was his love of the law and his view that the American people deserve no less than our very best efforts to make the law better that was most important to us as a model and to him. Let me say something about him um, personally that was so important for me. I I, I know now, today, that I first met Bennett 25 years ago at this meeting. And there weren't that many women. And I wasn't quite sure who anyone was. And one of the first people that came to greet me, I realized later, I didn't know who he was, was Bennett Bosky. And I only began to appreciate who he was during the meeting as I was sitting at the very back, hoping that no one would see me, call on me, do anything. Um, in fact, I, I, it was the old Mayflower, and I used to sit on the stairs because I could see better that I came to realize who this nice man was who had come to greet me so warmly. And then I found out something very important, and that is that he was married to a lawyer, very unusual at the time. I didn't get to know Shirley well, but I will tell you that when she died, uh, for the first two or three meetings that we saw Bennett, I was really worried about him. He so adored her that I could see, even though he wasn't really talking about it, 
that it was as though the sunshine had just gone out of his life. It's no surprise to anyone that without in any way diminishing his love for her, his regard for her, his appreciation for her and the family that she brought him, he learned to find joy in life again. And although he is my model and my hero in the law, although I appreciate him in every way for what he did for the law and for the American Law Institute, I must tell you that in some ways the most important lesson he taught me was how in incredibly difficult circumstances and from grief, it was more important to find meaning and joy, and he did. A word now just about what he meant uh, to us. He would have loved today. We had the messiest possible discussion <laughs> about things that I'm sure Bennett never thought, and I can assure you my parents never thought we would be talking about <laughs> on the floor of the American Law Institute. But it was complicated. It was intellectually difficult. It was emotionally fraught, and it was messy. And more than anything, I kept looking over and thinking I saw him there about to sum up in a way that would get us out of wherever it was that we might be. And what I realized is that he left in all of us an important piece of him, as I know he did in each of you. There will be no day at my law, in my life at the law at which I won't feel him right behind me saying, you could do better. There won't be a single day when I do the work of the Institute that I won't know that Bennett will wonder if I'm working hard enough and I'll make it better. And there won't be a single day in the life of this Institute in which we don't tell the new people who come in, because that's part of the perpetual life that he's given, exactly what the Boski motion meant. And some of the family asked me what it meant, and I think everybody in this room now knows, but I want to tell you what I realized as I was thinking about um, trying to explain it to people. It was so brilliant that I am in awe, as always, that he even thought in these terms. What Bennett realized is that as a body trying to improve the law, we had this written stuff, and the written word was everything to us. But that in the course of the discussion, the members made many suggestions that made it better, that made it nuanced, that made it more clear, that the reporters understood that they had missed a little something. And the brilliance of that motion is it allowed us to approve the written word so that we could go on with our work with the principled understanding that the reporters and everybody else that touched that draft would go back and include the sense of the body before it got finally published. In every piece that we publish from the day that Bennett figured this out in 1971, as long as the American Law Institute does work, Bennett Bosky will be there, making us better, making the law better, and best of all, for those of us who knew him, I hear his laugh so many times, and I did this morning, and I thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Our next speaker is the Director Emeritus of ALI and Professor of Law, Lance Liebman. Thanks, Harold. The, the, uh, uh, um, Basically, uh, Roberta said everything that, that I had made notes to say, uh, but uh, uh, a couple of things I'll add. Um, yesterday, uh, uh, many of you know, uh, Justice Sotomayor spoke here, 
And she used the word mentors. And she talked about two people, Judge Cabranes and Justice Stevens, who had been important mentors to her. And that put that word mentor in my head as I was thinking about today and about Bennett. And, and that's the word, and I want to say a little bit about what an extraordinary mentor he was to me and, and how important it was. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say not just important to me in figuring out how to be director of this very complicated and, and to use Roberta's word, messy organization. Uh, uh, and he was my mentor, and I'm going to say a little bit about that. But as I thought about it, and, uh, uh, I realized that there came into my head uh, two occasions from my life where somebody didn't mentor me. And the first was in my first year of teaching, and it was difficult, and I was trying to learn how to teach the subject of first-year property and, and reform it and, and modernize it while staying also involved with the traditional things that had been taught. It was very hard. Carol, my wife, was uh, a first-year law student, and we had two little kids, and life was very complicated and difficult trying to figure these classes out. And one day, I just was not ready, and I couldn't figure it out. And I went to a property teacher. I won't give you his name. He's still alive and a very fine person. But I went to him uh, down the hall with 20 minutes left before my class, and I said, I won't say his name, X, I said, uh, 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 what is the difference between a covenant and an easement? And, and uh, there was a pause, and then he said, Lance, you really do have a problem. <laughs> that, that was non-mentorship, okay? <laughs> the second one also involved a Harvard, I was at Harvard at the time, a Harvard uh, uh, property teacher whose name I can use because he's been dead for quite a while, um, a person named, some of you know and were studied with, named A. Period James Kasner, and we students called him the James Kasner. <laughs> and and uh, Jim called me and, and, and uh, summoned me to his office. Again, I was a little kid, and that was maybe my second or third year teaching, panic panicked about, about whether I was going to get tenure and uh, 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 actually sharing a secretary with one other. Today, they give a secretary to maybe eight professors, but in those days it was two. And, and uh, uh, another guy my age who was equally panicked about whether he was going to get tenure uh, uh, um, um, and, and uh, 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 now he sits on the United States Supreme Court. But anyway, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Kasner summoned me to his office. And, and this is one of the first times I really thought about this organization. Without talking to me, he had made me a member of the ALI uh, the year before, or something like that. And, and uh, by the way, Steve Breyer is the other person I was, uh, who was panicked like me. Uh, and Kasner summons me. Uh, having made me a member of the ALI, and he says something like, on May 15th, this was probably in March or April or something, Lance, you are going to be at the Mayflower Hotel in, in Washington in order to vote for my project on, on uh, 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 the rule against perpetuities, okay? And I said, yes, sir, and that was the first ALI meeting I ever attended, and that was not mentorship either. Bennett was mentorship, and, and uh, uh, people came after me for, for this job, and, and it's a very complicated job and not an obvious one, and to try to figure out even what you're supposed to do and how you combine it with your teaching and how often you should be in Philadelphia where our offices are and a uh, hundred other things. And, and I did get help from Judge Webster, who had played a big role in recruiting me, uh, from Jeff Hazard, who was my predecessor, from Charles Wright, who was the president, from Mike Trainer, uh, from several other people sitting in the second row here. But, 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 but Bennett was, it was just over the top in terms of uh, his help to me probably being in total similar to what all these other very good people did combined. And, and I would talk to him with a lot of regularity, and he never failed to pick up the phone when I called. 
and we'd have issues about what projects we should take up and who should be the, the reporters and with, which reporters were in such trouble that maybe we needed to replace them or, or find a way to, to improve their work and, and what should be at the annual meeting and what wasn't ready for the annual... All these things that Roberta perfectly summarized in this notion of the Bosque motion, which is the great concluding moment at the meeting where something is imp- approved. But, but from here to there, you know, in other words, the, the, when this meeting is over uh, Wednesday, uh, then it's a year till the next one during which things have to happen almost every day. And uh, I didn't talk to Bennett every day, but I talked to him pretty often. And, and I'm now realizing, I hadn't focused on this, that when I first met him, like Roberta, when I you know, got involved in this thing, uh, he was over 80 years old. And, and that's amazing. And then it just went on for my entire 15 years, you know, as he got well into his, well into his 90s. And, and, and all that way, he was still uh, giving me examples from the past and parallels and mistakes and, and suggestions, always positive, always supportive, never, never trying to make things, make things more difficult at all. So that is my uh, 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 definition of, of mentorship. Um, I, I've got three other short comments. One uh, uh, is um, um, if you're thinking about the days when Bennett uh, uh, amazingly was, was a law clerk to Learned Hand and then to two Supreme Court justices for a total of three years, you might want to get hold of a novel called Allegiance by Kermit Roosevelt, who's, who descends from... Theodore Roosevelt is a law professor and an ALI reporter on our Conflict of Laws project. And that is a silly mystery set in the Supreme Court in Bennett's years there uh, about the Japanese exclusion cases and things like that that he worked on. And as I recently read that novel uh, recommended to me by by Stephanie Middleton, uh, 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 I was counting on being able to talk to Bennett to see what he would think of, the, and I think he would not think well of the way <laughs> of the way Justices Black and Frankfurter are portrayed as scheming troublemakers inside the court and maneuvering with law clerks and things like that. It's a it's an inside the Supreme Court kind of uh, uh, kind of novel. Uh, but I'll never find out what what Bennett, who was there at the time. Thought about, uh, uh, thought about that book. Second of the three things. Um, 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 uh, by accident today, total coincidence, friends uh, took us to lunch at the Cosmos Club. And that's one of Bennett's places, right? And, and uh, 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 I never met Shirley because she passed away more or less at the starting moment of my getting involved. If, if she had lived another month, I'm sure I would have met her at some, at some ALI meeting, but I did not meet her. On the other hand, he did call me, uh, or I called him about something, and he brought up the question uh, of whether the, the Cosmos Club would let him have the event like this for Shirley uh, at this place if a rabbi came and stuff like that, and did they do these kinds of things? And I said, I don't know, you know, what do I know? I'm living in New York, what do I know about the Cosmos Club? The next day he called and he said, well, they won't let us do it on Saturday, whatever time he had in mind, because uh, they were already scheduled at that time for a bar mitzvah. (laughs) And uh, I thought that was a great American story. Um, 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 Finally, Carol was reminding me that Bennett was in New York for something, actually to be with some relative. And uh, this is, give or take, six or seven years ago. We can't pin it down exactly. And uh, Carol had had some medical issues, and she mentioned them to Bennett, and we were eating something or drink, do whatever we were doing together. And, and he said that he had just gotten a new pacemaker, uh, 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 a new battery for his pacemaker. And he said, can you believe they're telling me this will only last six more years? <laughs> And at that time, he was something like 92 or 93 or or something like that. So the way I would sum it up is by saying, uh, by my lights, 
uh, Bennett was the great mentor, not just to me, not just to Roberta, not just to many other people in this room and at this meeting and not at this meeting. He was the mentor to the American Law Institute for this 40-year period or whatever it was. And we are so lucky that, that and, and, and I'm sure he did also benefit from, from having this role with this organization. Our next speaker is Ross Davies, the uh, publisher of Green Bag Second and a professor at George Mason University. Ross. Uh, Bennett Bosky was good with words. Uh, he uh, was also usually pretty circumspect with them as well. Uh, he liked the low keys. Uh, thus, if he were sitting here today, he would silently accept that mild compliment about being good with words with a slight amiable nod and perhaps an equally slight, slightly toothy smile. Uh, but if the full truth were spoken at full volume, that uh, that he was one of the most sophisticated, most skillful, most useful and generous practitioners of and writers about the law in his generation, he would silently object with a slight annoyed shake of his head and perhaps an equally slight how did he do this wrist flick? What would you call that? You know what I'm talking about. He would not say that the fuller compliment was untrue because, in fact, it is true. Uh, rather, he would object because, as he would likely explain if asked, it says more than needs to be said. <laughs> Don't tell people what they already know. <laughs> A little reminder is enough, if not more than enough. Nevertheless, on rare occasions, Bennett himself could be pretty emphatic about already known truths when he felt sufficiently strongly about someone or something. It is suggested, suggestive of his good spiritedness that the best examples and strongest expressions of this tendency involve praise. Consider, for example, his view of a lifelong friend from the New Deal era. Edward H. Levy. This is Bennett on Edward Levy. Here was a person of truly extraordinary dimensions, both in intellect and in character. As he journeyed through the successive stages of a long and productive life, the suitable descriptive adjectives knew no bounds. Edward was scholarly, inquisitive, learned, ethical, fair-minded, practical, empathetic, philosophical, patriotic, unflappable, family-oriented, and most important of all, he was perceptively wise. Surely this is a case where the whole person was far more than the sum of all the parts. Bennett was good with words. And for another example, consider Bennett's view of Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone, for whom he clerked from 1941 to 1943. Bennett on Stone. He enjoyed discussing with us, meaning his law clerks, the merits of the cases, and would be pleased when we uncovered some new facet that had been in danger of being overlooked. In the preparation and revision of opinions, he counted heavily on our critical judgment. He never treated us with the condescension which older men sometimes show toward their young assistants. <laughs> We all came quickly to admire his qualities as a judge. He was cautious, deliberate, occasionally even rather slow in making up his mind. He was gifted with an extraordinary sense of proportion. Good with words. 
You can see the themes by now, I expect. They come through in Bennett's emphasis on the, the cool excellence of great minds, the perceptively wise, and the extraordinary sense of proportion. And at the same time, in Bennett's emphasis on the warm excellence of great spirits. Empathy. And pleasure in the accomplishments of others. And to reinforce that a little bit, here is what Bennett thought of another lifelong friend from the New Deal, Warner W. Gardner. Bennett on Warner. He was magnificent in spirit, magnificent in accomplishments, and magnificent in judgment. Of the old-fashioned virtues, Warner had a comfortable abundance. He enjoyed, yes, he enjoyed the benefit of a fine education and made the most of it. He developed a capacity to be self-reliant and yet congenial at the same time. He had a knack of working with others, which was to sustain him, as well as the others, throughout his long life. One of Warner's enviable gifts was that in discussions with colleagues, he was able, by his example, but without prodding them, to instill in them a sense of wishing to emulate his excellence. Good with words. But now, just to make it clear that Bennett was able to see and was willing to object to the absence of those qualities, where he thought they ought to be present, consider his opinion of someone who was offered the benefits of Warner Gardner's knowledge and judgment and ignored them. Bennett on someone. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the early 1950s, when Alpheus T. Mason was working on his massive biography of Harlan Fisk Stone, he asked Warner W. Gardner, who had been Stone's law clerk for the October term 1934, to furnish him with some comments about Stone. Gardner sent a memorandum to Mason, a man who, in the opinion of a number of us who were Stone law clerks, was in many respects a singularly unperceptive individual. <laughs> it is fair to note that not much of the tone or the spirit of what Gardner had to say found its way into Mason's nevertheless fascinating biography. Think for a moment about Bennett's word choices here. The express damnation is tough. Mason was singularly unperceptive. But the faint praise at the end is devastating. The nevertheless fascinating biography. Ouch. <clears throat> In short, Bennett felt very strongly the value and the worthiness of being clear-eyed, forthright, and fair. And also the value, the worthiness of being diligent and civil and generous. And you get the sense from his descriptions of Levy and Gardner and Stone that the admirable qualities of those senior friends and colleagues, Levy was five years older than Bennett, Gardner seven years, Stone 44, that those qualities were worthy of emulation by all good people, including Bennett Bosky. It does indeed seem that he kept them and their qualities in mind across the better part of a long lifetime. The quoted passages span almost 60 years. His comments about Chief Justice Stone were written in 1946, those about Levy in 2000, those about Gardner in 2003. And he continued to write and to speak about them thereafter, up until very, very recently. And in fact, Bennett did share their magnificent qualities. Indeed, he fairly exuded them. Excuse me. As with his friend Levy, the suitable descriptive adjectives know no bounds. Bennett was learned, loyal, ethical, practical, imaginative, apparent, open-minded, empathetic, scholarly, inquisitive, resolute, unflappable, self-reliant, and yet congenial at the same time, funny when he wanted to be, and the list could go on and on. Most important of all, he too was perceptively wise. Like his friend Gardner, he was able by his example, but without prodding, to instill in others as Roberta mentioned, a sense of wishing to emulate his excellence. And like his boss, Chief Justice Stone, he never treated younger, less accomplished colleagues uh, with the condescension which older or more able people sometimes show. Shirley Bennett, too, is a case where the whole person was far more than the sum of the parts. And while Bennett may have been the last of his kind of his generation, 
That is, alas, what happens when you are an extraordinary person who lives a very, very long time. He plainly did not intend for his generation to be the last to give rise to individuals of his kind. He invested generously in giving others the opportunity to turn, in, to turn out like a stone, a gardener, or a levy. He invested in education, both liberal and legal, and in science, both social and medical, funding chairs and scholarships and studies on both sides of the Atlantic. And he invested himself as well as his wealth with service spanning primary school to graduate school and beyond, to the ALI, Aliaba, and so on. And then there was his work with many of the individuals in this room and many more not present. He was a practitioner, a sponsor, and a role model of all the fine qualities that he admired in his finest friends and colleagues. And what would his legacy be? He would not object to being missed because it would be unrealistic and unreasonable for him to expect anything else, right? He also would not object to the fair and appropriate use of his formidable body of work product. After all, that is what he produced it for. Most important of all, Bennett would not object if those people with whom he worked and those people in whom he invested were to aspire and strive in their own ways and within their own capacities to develop the qualities of a Harlan Fisk Stone or a Warner Gardner or an Edward Levy or, and this he just might concede, right? though whether it would be with a slight amiable nod or a slight impatient shake of his head, I cannot and dare not guess, a Bennett Bosky. And we would be the better for it. Well, that estimable Edward Levy had a son. And as you know, that son, as I understand it, will be the pre- is the president-elect of this institution and also dean of Duke University Law School and our next speaker. Well, it is uh, fitting and proper that I say a few words about Bennett. He had such a wonderful friendship with my, my, my father. Really, it was the two couples together, and I can remember this growing up. There was always such excitement when um, my folks were going to be with Bennett and Shirley in Washington, and frequently it was around uh, an event that involved the American Law Institute. And you've heard that my father hired Bennett actually to be his lawyer because when he left the Department of Justice, he left with a bunch of lawsuits and he wasn't entirely certain that, uh, that the department would continue to represent him with the vigor that he uh, hoped for. And he, uh, he used to say in Bennett's uh, company, and he, my father thought this was quite funny, that he had spent more on Bennett than he had earned in the entire time that he was attorney general. <laughs> And he also liked to say that Bennett didn't think this was funny at all. (laughs) Uh, I would just like to say, uh, just to tell one story, because it's uh, it stayed with me, and it's the first time that I that I met Bennett. I I don't exactly know when this was. I think it was in the early, the late 1950s. The probably I was eight or ten, and I was maybe on my first trip to Washington, and we were going to see Bennett and Shirley, and my folks had advised me that they didn't have children. And and if you can remember when you were eight years old and you heard there was a couple and they didn't have children, you didn't quite know how to process that. Was that a comment on all children, or uh, what what did that mean? How could that be? And um, I was very vague about that, but it was, it was at end. And they said, you must be on your best behavior <laughs> because they don't have children. They will be very worried about you. Um, and I said, well, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, you know, they'll have things in their house and they'll just be, they, they won't know uh, what to expect and they'll be worried that you'll wreck everything. And so I recall that we... Uh, went to the Lincoln Memorial and that Bennett took me by the hand and I remember thinking that you know 
didn't really need to take me by the hand, but he didn't have children, so he thought this was what you were supposed to do. And so I played along with it, and we walked up the stairs to the, that wonderful statue. And uh, Bennett said to me that he said, everything is in such perfect proportion. Do you know that Lincoln's fingers in, that, in the statue are actually six feet long? And I have absolutely no idea if that's true, but it, I, I suspect it must be true. And, um, and, and Bennett went on uh, to express his tremendous admiration for Lincoln. And then we went from there down, back down the stairs, got into the car, and we went to Bennett and Shirley's house. And my parents, again, I think my mother whispered to me, best behavior. <laughs> And so I would just say that when I think of Bennett, I think I must be on my best behavior. <laughs> and I think I'm hearing that as a theme here today, that all of us know that when, that, that's another way of saying that Bennett brought out the best in people. And then I, I like to think too of Bennett in the Lincoln tradition. You know, the great, the great American lawyer, uh, Bennett was a, a certain kind of lawyer in Washington at a certain, at a certain time in our history, and, and even though he was in the national seat of power, he was very similar to the county seat lawyer, you know, that uh, Justice Jackson described, the unsung hero of the republic. Thank you, Bennett. David, you should meet my children. <laughs> They were told so many times they needed to be on their best behavior. Our next speaker is Richard Keefe, Vice President of MedStar Washington Hospital Center. When I have an important message to share, or what I think is an important message to share, I usually put it on a, one of my business cards, um, because I figure if I can't say it on, on one card, I, I can't say it. I don't, I'm not doing it justice. Well, unfortunately, I have 13 today, <laughs> and it's because of why we're here. It's because of Bennett Bosky. Um, I'm honored to be here, but I'm even more honored to have been in Bennett's orbit, her, his orbit of life. And while I came relatively late to the scene, it has been meaningful in so many ways. Uh, and when I heard on Thursday that uh, he had passed away, uh, three thoughts came to my mind. Uh, the, the first... Um, was about his quiet enjoyment of nature, and I'll explain that in a, in a minute. Uh, the second was his passion for his alma mater, uh, Williams College. And his third was his intellectual curiosity in medical research, uh, because that's how I came to know him. Um, in visits with with Bennett, uh, for those of you who have been in his home, you know, you go down the steps and you, you sit in, I, I guess, what you would call a family room, but it has a, a wonderful big picture window in it. And it looks out onto the backyard, uh, lots of grass, lots of bushes, lots of trees, and, an, and a swimming pool that has a cover on it that sags because the rain collects in it. But that's important because that's a water source. And my wife, who is a reformed birder, uh, or a reforming birder, uh, calls that kind of area a bird condominium. And if you sat there with, with uh, Bennett, uh, you had to look out the window. And there was a bird feeder there. And there were always birds feeding. And then there were always squirrels coming by to get the what was down on the ground, the seed that was down on the ground. Uh, and an occasional rabbit would come by as well. And uh, I had the opportunity to sit in that room with, with Bennett a number of times. 
And it was just part of the atmosphere. It was just part of his orbit in that, in that room. And I remember him saying, I, I commented once that the squirrels might, were chasing away some of the birds, and he said, they never eat more than they need. <laughs> and uh, I, th- I thought that was a, a great way to see it, or to say it, and to see it. Um, his, uh, every uh, year for the last 16 years, my family and I have gone on vacation on Cape Cod. And I am a former bike racer, bicycle racer, and I still ride. Uh, and I have met some fellows up there who ride. And two years ago, uh, they decided they wanted to drive out to the Berkshire Mountains uh, and spend a day cycling through the mountains. So I went along with them. And uh, when I got back uh, from vacation, I shared this with with Bennett. And I shared it because I, I told him about uh, this incredibly beautiful climb up Mount Greylock, uh, which uh, I think is the highest point in, in Massachusetts. And uh, I also told him about the descent down the other side, and I went through Williamstown, and there's Williams College. And I had never been there before, but we rode through the town and rode through part of this beautiful campus. His eyes sparkled uh, when I, I shared about Mount Greylock and about uh, Williams College. And I believe it's because it meant so much to him. It was part of his youthful adventure. Uh, I, I don't know what he may have done on Mount Greylock and with his friends, uh, but I know that it was an incredibly important part of his life. The... Uh, the third thought that came to mind is his, to me is his intellectual curiosity. And as I mentioned, I came in contact with him uh, because of my work at the hospital center and with, the, uh, with uh, physicians like uh, Dr. Stephen Epstein, who's here today, um, especially having to do with cardiac research. And uh, Bennett was a great philanthropic supporter of research. And he was also a, a tough customer. He, he asked incredibly probing and, and uh, important questions and could always get to the, to the eventually to the nub, to the, to the, to the real kernel um, that needed to be addressed. And his, uh, his support of uh, uh, Dr. Epstein and, and Dr. Ron Waxman and others in, in their translational uh, research has made and will continue to make a difference in people's lives. And I believe that Bennett knew it wasn't necessarily going to make a difference in his life, but it pushed the boundaries. It pushed knowledge. It pushed our abilities beyond uh, today. And he knew that that was going to make a difference in, in people's lives. So if you think about it, um, three nice thoughts. Three thoughts about his enjoyment of the everyday nature that was in front of him. Um, his, his great love for his alma mater, and I am not a Williams alum, but he had great love for it. And his probing intellectual curiosity that pushed all of us to be better because it would make a difference in people's lives. Thank you. Bennett's niece, Amy Ludwig, will be our next speaker. I'm not a lawyer. Um, So uh, I will say that um, uh, my name is Amy Ludwig, and Bennett was my uncle. He was the beloved husband of my mom's sister, Shirley, for 58 years. 
And as you know, a friend of mine said that Bennett breathes rare air. And um, as, a, as you can imagine, as, for a, as a child, seeing this very handsome couple, and it was very clear that there was the most happy marriage and they, the way Shirley and Bennett always sparkled at each other and their delight in wordplay. And I remember fondly at visits seeing you know, the, the, a question of words coming up at our dinner conversation and Shirley running to the, the OED, which was prominently there, whipping out the magnifying glass and looking up words. And this would happen later on, things like when I said, I'm getting a ferret, and she'd go, a ferret, and go, look. <laughs> and, it, you know, come up with all the terrible associations Oxford has brought it. Um, but they always seemed in on some marvelous private joke that was just for the two of them. Uh, my aunt Shirley was the social face of the pair when they visited or joined us in, all in New York, because as Ross has said, Bennett was very sparing with his language. Um, she was the one regaling us with uh, tales of their travels. He would be looking on and admiring her and smiling. So I knew him more as the silent partner at that time, though he never lost the gift for dropping in the driest of comments at the choicest of moments. Um, and he knew how to, he did know how to make his words count. So I began, when I grew up, I began to getting, getting to know them as an adult, in part thanks to ALI, because you all had meetings in Chicago, and I was living in Chicago at the time, so when you had a meeting, I got a visit. And they were able to come see plays I directed, and things I uh, performed in, discuss opera we'd enjoy. We started finding our shared love of travel, and, uh, and, and finding the things that we could share as adults, not just as... as relatives. Um, I was touched to see them still flirting, always, as we shared breakfasts and dinners. And we learned how to translate, because I would discuss a, a creative project or something, and Bennett would, of course, want to know hard numbers. What is this? How many people are coming? You know, how many people are coming? How are you getting the word out? What is this costing? How are you doing this? Um, and also, I remember that when I started traveling, I don't know if some of you who've been to the house, remember the circle of frogs that used to be on the upstairs table? Um, it was a big moment for me when I got him a little uh, black clay frog in Oaxaca and brought it back, and it actually, I sent it up there, and I thought, this won't make the cut, you know? <laughs> because it's not theirs, it's not from their trip. And then when I came on the next visit and saw it there on the table, I really felt like I was being accepted. <laughs> Uh, and I also want to talk about how being a mentor, because Bennett and, and our lives became more intertwined after my aunt died. Um, she and my father died within a few months of each other and left, left, were generous, left me a little bit of a bequest, and I decided to use that to buy a house. And I was, of course, talking to Bennett about this, and now he had no one left to speak for him in the family. He had to do that part himself. And so I told him about this, and I found this very, tear, almost a tear-down house, and he decided to be generous and help, and help make this possible. And I debated accepting that, because I thought, you know, uh, why should I do this? And then I thought, he'll take pleasure in it. He's a canny man. He's not giving away this without knowing what it's for. And uh, so... I called him every week and gave him all of the tedious details on the repair, on the upkeep, on the I'm putting in this kind of floor, I'm choosing these countertops, painting these colors, and so forth. And of course, Bennett was saying, like, don't make it too nice. <laughs> well, because he knew it wasn't really a great house. You know, it wasn't a landmark property or anything. So he was like, so don't do too much, is what he said. But he was, he was very interested, and he asked tough questions. And at the end of the year, when he came to visit, I gave him a tour. And he you know, looked, took him through the two floors and the whole thing. And he said, good work. <laughs> and if you know Bennett, you know that was high praise. <laughs> that's, about, that's about what you got, you know? And I, I thanked him. I knew he also was not a man who went in for messy emotions. And, you know, this is the family side of things. And I went in and I said, you know, Bennett, this has really filled a deep part in my heart that I didn't know I was missing. And he's sort of like, you know, not really what you want to talk about, but I think, <laughs> but I think he was pleased to hear that. 
And if we hadn't built a relationship over that year as adults, I would not have been coming to visit regularly, and I would not have been at his house right after 9-11. And I would not have been there when Dick Cheney finally came out of the underground bunker to appear on Face the Nation or whatever it was that Sunday morning. And that was the morning that Bennett had a heart attack. And so by this very slim change of chances, he had given me a home, and I was able to call for help for him. And... Uh, of course, he forbid me to call at first. He was fine. He was fine. And uh, who was, you did this little, that gesture. <laughs> and it will not surprise you that even an extremist, Bennett remained fully in charge as he's being strapped into the gurney to go in the hospital, to go, to go from in the helicopter. He's saying, you ride to the hospital with her and ordering me around <laughs> and... Uh, telling me where I should be staying, and when his doctors came in to describe the com complex of complexity, complex surgery they were going to have to perform, he said, is there any way you can do all of that tomorrow? <laughs> and he even tried to climb out of bed the next morning. And I really, I, Roberta's comments about making joy out of grief really, really stick with me, because he went on, you know, uh, living his life exactly as he wanted it for as long as he could. And um, as someone who has had to make my own family, I loved seeing that and how he did that. And we had regular visits. They weren't always chatty, but they were comfortable. And usually it was what's called parallel play. <laughs> you know, I'd come, I'd come and we'd talk for about 15 minutes and then we'd sit and I'd take out whatever project I was working on and he'd take out whatever he was working on and we'd just sort of hang. And we just would both do our work and occasionally you know, make each other a cup of tea or whatever. Um, but I felt honored that I was just being included to just that we could be quiet and just be comfortable and just do our, our work together. And even as his body grew less steady, his mind remained razor sharp. And there was always a, a pile of books and articles that he was writing or editing. But he always reached out to young people. I'm grateful that my sister's sons, William and Robert, got to know him and that he loved hearing William talk baseball. And which was probably more interesting than hearing me talk theater. So, <laughs> And he never stopped being curious about the world and working to advance his chosen causes. So when you look at all the relationships he built through, with ALI and through his philanthropy and his long career, you can see he built a wonderful family of choice. So they had children in many ways, in many, many ways. And I may have been lucky to have him as my uncle, but I know that for many of you he has been no less family as well and we will all miss him tremendously. Thank you. Our last scheduled speaker is another niece, Lisa ledwood Khan. So to me, tell me I'm not you know, used to this, Uncle Bennett was a rock of Gibraltar in my life, for all my life. He was steady and he was solid. And I remember when I was little, little, something had happened and I had a stuffed animal whose name was Pinky. Pinky was a little brown dish dog with pink ears. And Pinky was Pinky until whatever it was that this was happened. And then Pinky needed a last name. And Pinky got the name Pinky Bosky. <laughs> because I knew that Uncle Bennett and Aunt Shirley would never let me down. And they didn't. And I'm going to share some images from my own photo album through the years. And the first one is a picture that I was not old enough to see, that I feel I was in because it's been described to me so many times. My mother, Aunt Shirley's sister, became a widow when I was two months old, and we moved 
maybe several months later, to live with my grandparents in Manhattan in their apartment, where there was plenty of room. But mom wanted us to have our own place and to be able to have, to not be under her parents' watchful thumb. And she told my grandparents that this was what she wanted to do, and they were not amused, and they were not enthusiastic. And as the family story has it, Uncle Bennett walked, stood next to Mom, silently, but there, and she felt that he was on her side, and that's all that my grandparents needed to say, okay. And I am grateful to him because without that, I might not have the brother and sister that I have today because my mom met my dad several years after that and the father of my brother and sister. So then we fast forward to the 1960s. Not so, well, fast forward. And my brother and sister, who are here, my cousin Sarah and her brother David, who is no longer alive, had the amazing, amazing opportunity and gift to have our own personal version of Jack and Jackie Kennedy, our own personal Camelot, with our these three couples, Aunt Shirley and Uncle Bennett, Uncle Alan and Aunt Liz, and my parents, Arthur and Laura Ludwig. They were smart, they were attractive, they reveled in each other's company, and we were just amazingly, amazingly fortunate to grow up in that cocoon. In the 70s, Thanksgiving was, well, always a, our family gathering time, and the dinners alternated between being at our house or a block away at my New York aunt and uncle's. And Aunt Shirley and Uncle Bennett would come up on the train and for a visit. And so <laughs> I can't remember exactly what year it was, but Uncle Bennett was a dapper dresser always. And he was wearing some crazy, I think the plaid jacket that, he, that Andrew now has. And he looked like Kirk Douglas. And except with the 70s, you know, sideburns, very, very stylish at the time. And he and I were the only members of the family who liked dark meat for turkey. And that was sort of a joke, you know, as it was. But this year, in biology class, we had raised chickens, hatched them from an incubator. And I said I, to my mom, because it was at her house that year, that I could not eat turkey that year. And Uncle Bennett, bless him, said he wasn't going to either. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1976, the summer after high school, I came to live with Aunt Shirley and Uncle Bennett in their house for the bicentennial summer. I worked at the Renwick Gallery, and I had cocktails, vermouth, and other things before dinner that I had never had before, and they introduced me to different grown-up things, uh, meeting their friends, going to the theater with them, going to some of the things like the folk festival on the mall, and Aunt Shirley and I doing crossword puzzles or jigsaw puzzles while Uncle Bennett would be editing these blue booklets. And that was the year that I met. Sharon, who at that time was Uncle Bennett's secretary, but as charming and everything that you, you still are. And we were both young ch chickens. <laughs>
I, never mind, let me else. So in 1980, I graduated from college, and I did not want to go back and live in New York. So I came to live in Washington, but not near, not in Uncle Bennett and Aunt Shirley's house. And in the same way that my grandparents had said, okay, to my mom, my mom said, okay, you know, you'll be near Shirley and Bennett. And I did live in a group house, and we spent a lot of time at Uncle Bennett and Aunt Shirley's, in part because they, were, they had a swimming pool <laughs> that worked at that point. Not the cover, but it was an open pool, and they would let us have pool parties. They you know, people over for dinner and a swim. But one of the highlights of that time was July 29th, 1981, the wedding of Charles and Diana, which took place British Standard Time at 11.20 in the morning. But Anne Shirley and Uncle Bennett, being Anglophiles, we had planned to celebrate this momentous event. And so we woke up well before 6.20 in the morning because we wanted to see the whole parade, the whole of everything. And Aunt Shirley had made some high tea for breakfast. And we had a pajama party watching the royal wedding from beginning to end, all three of us. And it was just, it's one of those things in the television room, you know, just one of those, again, pictures in my, in my memory book. And that's probably also around the time when I met Chris Sargent, who isn't able to be with us today, but I think his son is, son-in-law is here. And Chris and Uncle Bennett were friends. They were, or what to say, financial detectives. Because one of the things in the early days that they enjoyed was finding an unknown company, getting to meet the management, and deciding whether to take a risk and in, invest. As and also that it was a certain kind of, of partnership and friendship that had remained to this day. Then Aunt Shirley died, and as Harold said, it was an earthquake in Uncle Bennett's life. And I remember him reading a note from Justice Ginsburg, who he knew, that said, stick with your work. That will keep you going. Keep connected to the people that you care about and he took her advice. In 1999, the ALI was in San Francisco, and Uncle Bennett had been very, very supportive of Harold's and my journey to become parents through adoption. And he arrived to, we was there when we had a reclaim, a baby reclaimed. And it was one of, again, these incredibly, incredibly strong memories of him saying, without saying it, that he was there for us. And with saying, what he did say was that if we kept pursuing our, our dream, that it would happen in due course. And he was right. It did. So in 2000, my first Mother's Day, came to New York to celebrate that with my mom. And then we took a train because we had to show Uncle Bennett our son, our son William. And it, the trip wouldn't have been complete without it. And when Harold became a judge in 2001, Uncle Bennett loved Harold and respected him and respected his position and told us that he wanted our son and subsequently our other son to have the kind of education that, that we wanted them to have and that he didn't want us to be stopped by Harold's salary as a judge as opposed to a lawyer. And so he said that he wanted to provide their education, and, and that's what he did. In 2006, my sons <laughs> were told to be on their best behavior, <laughs> and Uncle Bennett said, 
There are two rules of this house. Do not touch the frogs. <laughs> and do not run. <laughs> you probably <laughs> heard that too. So, and at that time, I met Lily, who has been you know, keeping the home fires burning since, what, probably around, around then, and was the, the light of home after Aunt Shirley was no longer there. So 2007, the ALI is in San Francisco, and Uncle Bennett was, could be a very intimidating figure. He rang the doorbell. My eight-year-old son, our eight-year-old son, answered it. He said, Uncle Bennett, welcome to our house. He said, I want to show you my room and tell you what the rules are. <laughs> and Uncle Bennett said, touche. <laughs> Not like this, but with a different, different one. <laughs> So we came every year for his birthdays, definitely since he turned 90, to celebrate with delicious carrot cakes from Sharon, or key lime pie, or different things. And when we would take the boys out after being there maybe for an hour, he would say, why do you want to do that? And looked at him, said, I want them to be able to come back here without wrecking anything. And they need, you know, to be, have their exercise. And my last, let's say, little known, I wonder how many people know or kn that Uncle Bennett could touch his nose with his tongue. <laughs> I don't know if he did that, Mr. Levy, with you. He did that for Shelley's daughters. But my boys used to giggle, and he got such fun out of doing that. So I will miss him, but I really feel so, so incredibly grateful to have known him and to have had him as, as an uncle. Do we say, if anybody else, is that what you can say? We have just a couple minutes. I know that many of you have an event this evening. Uh, but before I do ask anybody to, if they wish to come forward, I want to thank the ALI for allowing us to hold this service in conjunction with the meeting. And I want to particularly thank Stephanie Middleton, who has just been extraordinary in her graciousness and kindness to Bennett's family. So with the parameters of just a couple minutes or so, we have uh, someone who would like to come forward. That would be great. Thank you. My name is Louise Plum. I was the director of the primary day school from 1998 until 2012. I had the privilege of knowing Bennett as the chairman of the board. Bennett had been the chairman of the board for nearly 60 years. The school was begun in 1944 in the District of Columbia. It moved around from church basement to church basement for a while. And then some of the families at Primary Day, one in particular, um, along River Road out in the country in those days was the <clears throat> Arabian horse farm, Al Mahar. And they were willing to donate two acres of land to the school if it moved out River Road, but they needed to have a building and it would, they would, needed it guaranteed that the building could be funded and built at that location. And Bennett was brought on as legal counsel and also to help raise the funds. Well, he was able to get probably 10 guarantors of the loan. And one of them was 
Paul Mellon, so there was no problem that the loan would be guaranteed. So the school was built in 1955, and at that point, then Bennett came on the board and for many of those years, most of those years, served as the chairman of the board until about 19, 19, excuse me, 2000, um, well, he, in 2012, he no longer came to the board meetings, but he was very, very active within, within the workings of the board and, and all the decisions that were made. So I just wanted to express the gratitude of the Primary Day School for all that Bennett did for raising funds for it, keeping it in a solid uh, financial form, and the dedication that he gave to the staff, to the teachers, to the children, to the parents, and to me. I met Bennett uh, for the very first time at Shirley's memorial service. Our director had passed away, and I was named the acting director just a couple of days before that. And so my first encounter with Bennett was in the receiving line at Shirley's funeral memorial service. And he was so gracious in during that time when it was so difficult for him, that transition of losing Shirley and taking on the responsibility of the school with a brand new director. I will never forget the wonderful person that he was and the mentor that he was to me uh, during that time. And I will dearly miss him. I've spent many hours in that family room watching the squirrels and the birds as well. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else wish to come forward? I, seeing, oh, we have someone. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Kenny, and I'm Lily's daughter. And I'm here today to talk on behalf of Lily. She's kind of emotional right now, and I am too. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about Mr. Bosky, Unc Bennett, as we call him. Um, my mom has worked for him as a housekeeper for about 10 years. And during that time, I've grown to you know, love and care for him. Mr. Bosky was one of the kindest and encouraging individuals that I've had the honor to meet. He was one of the few people that encouraged me to go to nursing school. And uh, I remember the big smile he had on his face when I told him I became a registered nurse. He told me he was very proud and uh, you know, he was there for me if I needed him for anything. Mr. Bosky was a kind man. My mom, Lily, never ceased to praise Mr. Bosky on how he went above and beyond to help people around him, especially his employees. He was an exceptional man, and he will forever be missed. And he will always be in our heart. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, we've got another. Uh, my name's Guru Sangit Khalsa, and I've known Bennett most of my life. He was my mother's lawyer, and um, when she was in came to Washington, she asked the smartest girl in her Vassar graduating class, very brilliant woman, 
I need a lawyer. Can you recommend anyone? And she said, well, the smartest person I know is Bennett Bosky. And that began a long association and great friendship. And they had a very unique relationship. I saw Bennett laughing with her, yelling at her, everything. And um, Bennett was just a, what we always call a straight arrow. And very um, we, recently, the last visit we had with him, my husband asked him, well, what do you think of the political situation now with all these people running? And he went, eh. <laughs> <laughs> and that, <laughs> he had a lot of things that he said that to <laughs> at that time. <laughs> I'm just very grateful that he's been in our lives He's always been such a great help to our family, and I knew we were just such a tiny part of what he did in the world. But even though we were a tiny part of that huge world of his, he gave us as much love and attention as everything else, much concern, support, understanding. You know, he seemed to be very straight-laced, but he, he would do all these wild things that, you know, you wouldn't expect from somebody who just followed the rules. That wasn't Bennett. He was extremely generous, as everyone has said, and so smart, so intelligent. You always kind of felt you had to be on your best behavior whenever you were around him. But recently, our grandson met him, and Bennett had this wonderful chair that would go rising up so he could stand up easier, more easily. And our grandson was about four at the time, so he was riding up and down in Bennett's chair. And we'd brought Bennett some sweets. It seemed all he was interested in was in fruit or chocolate, some kind of sweets, at the near the last 10 years of his life, much like my mother was. And so our grandson was said, Mr. Bosky, here's a cookie. And so Bennett took the cookie. He said, now eat it. <laughs> so Bennett was, I'm eating my cookie. <laughs> you know? So he could follow the direction of a five-year-old. Anyway, I've just, I know we're all very lucky to have known him. He's been an amazing part of all our lives, very unique. And he accepted us as we are, turbans and all, as we went through our changes. And um, it's just been a wonderful experience, and I'm going to miss him a great deal. But I do feel grateful that he is now free, and as I would say, free as a bird, and enjoying everything and everywhere. That's how I feel about Bennett. Thank you. Anyone else? He was an amazing man. Thank you all for being here to celebrate his terrific, inspired life. Have a good evening. <laughs>